Listen to these words. I'm called by the will of God. He's saying, here's what's not gonna happen. Tony Robbins is wrong. Oprah's wrong. Rhonda Byrne is wrong. Eckhart Tolle is wrong. Here's what's gonna happen in the universe no matter how much you think positively and speak positively. The will of God's gonna get done. Not your will. If you're in control of the universe by your words, I'm terrified because you're a disaster. And your desires are narcissistic and self-serving at every moment. The Apostle Paul says, you want to know what's getting done in my life? I was called to be an apostle, not by my own will, but by the will of God. That's what he says. Because if it was my own will, I never would have called myself to this. Think about the amount of times you would choose pain, loss, and suffering if it was up to you. But pain, loss, and suffering is sometimes exactly what you need because the point of your life is not to become happy. It's to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the will of God for your life. You know that, Romans 8. And so the reality is this. How often would you choose the things that have actually shaped you into the person you are today? Rarely would you choose the things that actually hurt you, the things that caused you pain. I look back at my life and I am so glad the will of God was getting done versus my own will. When my mom and dad divorced when I'm eight or nine years old, I would never choose that in my life. But it's the only reason that I end up at summer camp at 10 years old and hear the message of the gospel for the first time and it roots a seed in my heart so that when I'm 17, 18 years old and Chris walks into woodworking class, something about me recognizes this. If in school, I don't end up taking guitar class because I didn't want to take any other course and the only course left was guitar. And I end up sitting beside a guy named Rob and Rob invites me to Bayfair Baptist Church over and over and over again. And finally, I go. And I get my wife out of the deal and I get Brad and Brad telling me that I'm going the wrong direction in my life and I need to go to Bible college. So without, without walking into woodworking class, I don't end up at Bayfair. I don't have a Bible college. I don't end up moving to Vancouver. I don't end up planting Village Church in 2010. And none of you are sitting here and any good that's happened at all in your life through Village Church and the ministry here doesn't even exist in your life unless my parents get divorced when I'm eight. You understand that? Thank God. He's in charge. That out of loss and devastation comes redemption and transformation and change. And you begin to think back to your life and on your deathbed, you're gonna look back and go, man, I know that I thought that even in my salvation, I was choosing God. I get to choose Jesus. I got to choose him. And on your deathbed, the veil will be pulled back. You go, my gosh, he was hunting me down the whole time because the reality in the universe is the will of God is the thing that's getting done, not your will. When it comes to your life, the world is a very broken place. And what's going to happen is you're not always going to win. You're not always gonna have the money. Your situation in life, no matter how much you try to take ownership of it and speak life and positive think, the corruption of the world around you is gonna mean some of you have faced marriages in decline. Some of them have ended. You have ended in a divorce. You're sitting there, you feel bad about it. You feel like you lost. Let me tell you something. It is not important in life that you always win. What is important is that you give a good account of yourself. When you lose the money and your kids look at you and they go, where's the money coming from? Listen, it's not important that you win, but that in that moment, you give a good account of yourself. When your friendships decline, when you make that massive mistake at work, when the thing you did, you couldn't speak life, no matter what you tried, the world beat up on you and a disaster happened like happens in all of our lives. Here's what the gospel comes along and tells you. It is not essential that you always win in life. What matters is when you're up against it, you give a good account of yourself. And the apostle Paul says, listen, I'm the kind of guy who actually killed Christians. What could God ever do with me? And he takes them and he writes 13 letters of the New Testament and founds a movement that changes the world. God will sometimes 
Take the suffering and the awfulness of your life. No matter what new age philosophy tells you, God will use you not because of you, but in spite of you. And for some of us, he entrusts awfulness and suffering so that it can impact other people. That's the reality. Some of us have it in us because we're strong enough that God sees us fit to bear on suffering so that the rest of the world can actually be influenced. Here's the beauty of the gospel. You get God, which means you get joy, which means you get, as Psalm 37 says, delight yourself in the Lord. Listen, Christianity is about your enrichment. It's not gonna lessen your life. It's gonna make you fully human. You get God in the end. You get the most delightful, beautiful pleasure you could ever imagine, the kind of joy that enriches your life. It doesn't dull in it. Your life is rich. He just said, your life gets enriched in Jesus Christ. It doesn't go bad. Do not take the pressure of religion and philosophy that tells you you always gotta be a winner or you're a loser. Take the philosophy that says, no, no, no. When life just gets destroyed around you, the point is not that you have to win every time. God will take your suffering and use it to do something amazing if you let him. You don't always have to win, but you gotta give a good account of yourself. For Christ also suffered once for all for sins, suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might, what? Bring us to God. You had sin that separated you from God, and Jesus is the one who bridged that gap. And this is the beautiful part, is that you know when you get, when you get the gospel, and here's what I want you to understand, because sometimes we don't understand this, because sometimes we think, well, if you understand the gospel and you believe in the gospel, then you get to go to heaven when you die. That's not actually what the explanation of the Bible is. You see, he died for your sins, so your sin is the thing that separated you from God. You know what you get when you believe the gospel? It's not that you go to heaven when you die. You get God. Isn't that beautiful? You actually get God. God created people. There was sin. He chose Israel. He chose Abraham. And through this people, I'm going to redeem. And then Jesus was the climax to that people, the Israel story. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's the good news. But then the beautiful part is, he says this. You have to make it personal. What I also received. Have you received it? for yourself? Have you taken the reality of the resurrection and actually gone, I'm going to take this into my own soul? You've been reading the Bible, the scriptures, as if they're about you your whole life. If I could just be like David, then maybe I could make some victories in my life. And he just said, no, no, the scriptures are about him. The Bible's not about you. It's about him. It's not about what you do for him. It's about what he's done for you. It's not about you performing for him. It's about his performance for you over and over and over again. That David story is not if you can just get enough courage, you can slay the giants in your life. It's about the fact that Jesus Christ, like David, a representative from Israel, came into the valley and went against your enemy and destroyed him while you were sitting up in the hills, scared, terrified, because you didn't want to fight Goliath, hiding behind a rock, hoping that someone else would fight it and impute that victory to you, even though you did nothing. That's what the Bible's about. That's what the gospel's about. And it frees you from every anxiety and every worry and every fear of your life because it's not esoteric teaching. It's not Buddhism. It's not philosophy. It's not new age. It's not about paths to get to a certain state of enlightenment. It's a historical moment about something that actually happened. And then the question is, what are you going to do now? Have you made it personal? Have you received it into your own soul? We sinned, and so that's why we all die. That's the Christian worldview. But that's not where it has to end for you. That's the whole brilliant point of this whole book and everything we gather about as a church, is if all you are is in Adam, then that's the end of your story, man. You're dead, the universe is cold and dark, and there's nothing. But there's a solution, and the solution is Christ. What he did on the cross, in the resurrection, there's no other option. The government is not going to save you and give you salvation.
doesn't matter how much money you have, what your reputation is, how successful you are, it is coming for you. And the only way to beat it, the only way to reverse it, isn't you, it's him, it's Jesus. There are basically two ways you can live. You can live in the context, if you're still in Adam, you can live in death, but if you're in Christ, you can be alive. That's the choice. Don't we all want this? Don't you want life and not death? That's what he's pleading with. I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. If you don't know Jesus, here are your options. There are only two options in the end. This is the only question that matters in the end. Adam or Christ, that's it. That's it. In the end, the only question is gonna be, what did you do with Christ? What did you do with the cross? Are you basing your own righteousness based on your life or Christ's life for you? In the end, that's the definitive question of every person who has ever lived in the history of the world, and that is not an overstatement. That's it. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. That hell is the result of a soul and a heart, not not believing, but not loving. My plead with you is some of you believe in God. Some of you believe in Christ, but you don't love him. You have no affection for him. So, Father, the end of this book is the most important. Philosophy and money and sex and spiritual gifts and ministry and how the church is organized, none of it matters if if we don't love you, because we can do all that stuff, get all that stuff right in our ecclesiology, in our life, and we can do it all right and still die and go to hell. Because we never loved you. We never cherished you. It's not who we were when no one was looking. It's not who we were by ourselves in the dark. So do a miracle. Let us be people who actually love, like you, treasure you, desire you, delight in you. Please let that be the definitive content of the faith that saves us. And if it hasn't been to this point in our life, let it be going forward and let us make the adjustments that need to be made so we don't just have faith in you, but we love you more than anything else on the planet. Because we know if we do that, no amount of temptation, no amount of suffering, no amount of persecution will ever derail us. Amen.